Okay, I'm afraid if she doesn't get help, she's gonna turn up like Sean and Raven and die in the streets. And I would run away from foster homes and I'm back out here. This is how I know how to live. I'm not gonna give it for adoption. I'm gonna give it what I never got as a child. I know that it's important to believe in yourself, but sometimes you can't do that unless you have someone to believe in you. I can't give up on them. What up, this is Rama Screen covering movies, TV, and entertainment, and it's time for another interview. And I'm here with writer, director Michael Leone. Is that correct? Yes. All right. About his new documentary, American Street Kid, which sheds light on the epidemic of homeless youth in America. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, I had the opportunity of screening this documentary. Uh, I have a lot of questions. Uh, let's start with the beginning here. Um, the documentary says that there are about 1.8 million homeless kids in America. Yeah. Where did that number come from? How did we get there? So basically it's a national um, statistic from all kids in different cities all over the, over the country. Mm -hmm. um, and they keep putting it out and I think it's almost close to 2 million now. Wow. So it was 1.8 when we started this, it's about 2 million now. And. Uh, is that socioeconomic kind of problem, like uh, our government problem, do you think, in a, on a general view? I think it's America's problem. America's um, problem. I think the government should get involved, and they think they do, but um, I think it's also hard for them to view it. I mean, these kids are hidden. They're in different, they're hiding all over in each city. They're hiding in different parts of the city, so it's hard to, like, see them, and so many people don't know it's even happening. Even people um, that work in the city, mayors and stuff, they don't really realize how many kids are really in the city like in LA alone there's 18,000 kids wow. and people just drive by and don't even know and people who come to see the movie have no idea that there's kids on the street they have no idea now what is it or why did you decide to want to document these kids so I went through a tough time um, myself in New York City mm -hmm. and I started um, talking to kids on the street I almost went homeless myself and I started gathering their stories and um, I put it, what I knew what to do at the time, I'm a director of theater and film, so I said, let me turn this into a theater show. Mm -hmm. And I put all the stories together and I um, produced and directed the show called The Playground. And um, homeless kids would come to see the show and they, um, and I wanted to make sure I was portraying them accurately. So I'd have them get involved. And I got close to two of these girls, um, one was 16, one was 20. And bef right after the show closed, um, they were both found dead. One was murdered and one was found dead on the street. And I said, this is bigger than a play. So I went out to shoot a PSA, which was a two minute commercial for these kids. And as I was out there, I was like, this is way bigger than two minutes. So I spent uh, about six years on the streets with them. Now, uh, in the documentary, uh, you uh, at first, the beginning, you were kind of having trouble getting their trust yeah. uh, because many of them don't want to be seen on camera. So. Um, were there any moment during that process or early stages that you kind of felt unsafe? I would say in the beginning, I was definitely nervous to talk to them, even though I had met kids. Mm -hmm. um, they're very, um, you know, this is why there's not a lot of documentaries or stuff about homeless kids, because people mm -hmm. feel like they're exploiting them or um, not portraying them accurately. So at first it was definitely scary. Mm -hmm. um, but after like the day and they a day or so when they really realized what we were doing, they came on board with me and they joined me on this team. And there was definitely times I was scared, especially in Venice at night. There's a lot of gangs and stuff, but the kids had my back. I felt like I had a ton of bodyguards out there, so it was great. And we had a small crew, so it was just me and the camera person and these kids. So how long till they actually say, "Yeah, you can film us"? By the, f I mean during the day was in intense. That night got scary. By the first night, actually. I bonded with one kid and he called me that night. He was suicidal and um, he th his friends were telling me he was ODing of heroin in a hotel room. So I went there that night after I met him that day. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, the kids trusted me. And how did you decide on oh, the subject matters? You know, there's Nick, there's Greens, yeah. and uh, how did you decide on this? Well, when you go out there, you start, okay, who do you, which kid is, what kid is really on board with what I'm saying, what kid wants to share this message. Mm. Um, and I interviewed probably 300 to 400 kids and you start following one story and then you start following another and you start following another. And at the beginning, we thought one of our main characters was gonna be Shauna and then she ended up dying. So you, it was very difficult in the editing room because you have all this footage of all these kids and you're, how do I put this together and make a coherent story? Mm. Um, but it just kind of worked out and the kids trusted me and I, the most, it really came down to, 
how much footage do I have on each kid and how can I tell a story? Now, I know what it's like to have a, like a full-time job and this other passion that you're tr trying to pursue, at least for me. And uh, so how do you juggle that, you being a f director and uh, doing this as well? So what was great is that we put out to the world that we need money to keep making this. So we got a lot of donations at the time to help help the movie. Um, but also, luckily, I mean, I didn't have a lot of money making this. I um, moved out of my bedroom. I stayed in a garage. We actually went homeless at one point. I was living in my car at one point making this movie. Um, and luckily, I sold a screenplay. And that's how I got myself together, and I put that money towards the movie. Coming out Hollywood. Yes. I have these two young girls who are about 15. This kid I met, is there any place I could bring him tonight? You would have to check back first thing Monday morning. They're telling me there's nowhere to put a girl under 18. I think that's ridiculous. <laughs> If we don't show up, what's gonna happen? I just got a call from Kiki. If someone's trying to rape her or grab her, and now she's gone. I haven't seen her, haven't heard from her. It is life or death. Every day I was going out to fight this unwinnable battle. These boys are like brothers to me. I just don't want to see the streets suck them back in, you know? At one point did you decide that, you know, I can't just document them, I gotta actually, you know, help them emotionally and be their friends? That was pretty much instant, like that first night I went and helped. And that's when the DP and the producer saw, mm. wait, this isn't just a documentary about kids. This is about how these kids are reaching out for help. Because a lot of people go out there and they're not, in a documentarian, you're not supposed to really get close to your subjects. You're supposed to exactly. keep that line. But when you see a kid who's 16 um, and you don't know if you're going to live or die, you, you kind of just say, screw the camera. And you just go and you do what you have to do. You follow your heart and you just go and do whatever you can to help them, and that's what kind of what happened. But you gotta understand my question though, because uh, regular folks would not probably uh, allow you know, homeless kids to enter their apartments yeah. and their homes is like that, but you, you know, with an open heart, you just did, that's amazing. You build a trust, and um, because they're so tight-knit as a street family, they kind of allowed me into their street family, and um, it was at that point, when I started bringing them back to my house, it was family, it was no longer kids on the street, they were my brothers and sisters. And that's uh -huh. just what it is. Uh, here's a funny question. I, I, there's a funny moment in the documentary that I noticed that uh, I think your co-producer, uh, you had this uh, talk on the phone, and it's like, no, I want to have them as my uh, uh, assistants. Yeah. So your producer's like, no, 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 I know you love these boys, but no. And then the next scene, you actually have them yeah. as your assistants. <laughs> so my question is that, um, what did your co-producers think about that scene, and uh, are you guys still friends? <laughs> oh, absolutely. She's my producing partner. Um, she, we always laugh at that and the kids laugh at it because she was definitely like, they cannot do this job. And I believed that you give them the skill and they will perform. And that's exactly what happened. And he was one of my, one of my favorite stage managers of all time. He took control of the room. Even to a point when I was directing other things, he would run this whole, he ran the whole show for 10 months without me there. And he was in charge and he did an amazing job. So I think that you, you just believe and they believe and it works out and the producer is like, ah, put her foot in her mouth after that because she really saw how well they really did. Can you talk a bit about the cycle? Because in the documentary you said, hey, if we just give these people home, you know, and we're not really being family to them, then they will go back to the streets again. Like, the, you know, you got to make that connection. It can't be just like, here, here's a home, here's a bed. Can you talk a bit about that endless cycle? Yeah. When I first started, um, I was like, okay, let me get them, if I get them into transitional living or if I get them into a shelter, yes. they'll be taken care of. And then when I realized when they were there, they would relapse or they would get kicked out or whatever. I'm like, okay, what, what is really going on? And you start to realize throughout months of filming, you go, oh, it's not just about getting them off the street. It's about the mental state of where they are. They're, these kids are so abused that they have no self-worth. And you have to go, okay, what is it that they need? And what they really need is family and connection. So I believe that this is m my message is every nonprofit out there, you know, they feed hundreds and hundreds of kids and it's an amazing thing that they're doing, but we have to have programs that go into these places and look at them one-on-one -on -one and make sure that they are important because that's what they're missing. They know they had never had self-worth. They had no, they never had anyone showing them that they were loved. So if now they're just, you know, barreled in with a hundred kids into a nonprofit, they're not going to get seen. So you have to make sure they're seen and heard, and um, I believe that they will be successful from that point on. Can you give us an update on Nick Greens and I think what's the, what's the singer's name? 
ish. Yeah. Um, Nick's doing amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got a full time job. Greens is getting married in wow. March, and he has, also has a full time job. Um, ish is doing well. He's still working on his music. I think he battles. You know, he was on the streets since like, being a baby. So um, he definitely battles that more than the rest. Um, Kiki's doing amazing. Um, I talked to Bubbles in school. Um, I talked to pretty much all of them. Um, even kids that aren't in the movie, I still do, I still talk to. Facebook's been a great place. So that's where we all communicate, um, which is wonderful. Excellent. Yeah. Now, uh, for my fans, spare some change. Talk a bit about that. SpareSomeChange.org is a nonprofit that we started making this movie, and it's a mentoring a mentoring program. So our goal is to take this mentoring program into all these nonprofits, and eventually create a place called um, Transformational Living House, which is the Change House, which is a two-year program where kids can get off the street and have this two-year program to rehabilitate their lives. So is that a way that people can uh, can help with the costs? Yeah, I mean it's it's a big program, so it's going to take a while to make that happen. But yeah, we're starting it now. And so when can my, or where can my fans see your documentary? Um, it, um, it was released December 11th in five different cities and then in January. Um, and then it'll keep, keep going to different cities. So December 11th, it's in Chicago, Washington, D.C., Fort Lauderdale, Los Angeles, Casper, Wyoming, and then New York City, Detroit, Boston, and in January, and then some other cities after that in February. Last but not least, what's your advice to other artists filmmakers, screenwriters out there that also want to take on an issue, whether it be homeless kids or, you know, maybe um, climate change, what have you. What's your advice on them, like, trying to juggle that? You never give up. And if you believe in your message and you believe in what you're saying, you have to go 100%. And I got so many people telling me, you're ridiculous for doing this. Just put it down. It's yeah. ruining your life. But when you have a message and you're going to help change the world, you that is what you have to follow that passion. You have to stay and you have to keep going, no matter what. Michael Leone, thank you so much for talking to me. Congratulations. Thank you.